On today's show, let's ask some of the biggest questions between the Mavs and the Clippers series. Do the Mavericks need Tim Hardaway Jr. to step up the way that he did back in the series before? I don't think they do. We'll talk about that and ask more questions about Mavs Clippers on today's Lockdown Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Lockdown Mavericks. Welcome to the Mavericks, NBA champions. He is the It's good, and the Mavericks have won the game. If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for being part of the bonus show, making Locked On Mavs your first and probably your second listen today. Where the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day on any podcast platform, Apple, Spotify, etc., Leave a five-star review, like the video on YouTube, and comment anything below. Let me know in the comment section on YouTube, what's your biggest question about Mavs vs. Clippers? Today's extra episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I gotta admit it, I got a competitive side, and it's I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on a classic game of Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go free on the App Store or Google Play. Extra episode today, we're just gonna do this. This is, this is what we are now. <laughs> Mavs, Clippers, and we going into the playoffs. We'll continue. I'll just do episodes until I die, I think. <laughs> until, until that happens. We did an episode earlier today with Reggie talking through some of my biggest questions. We talked about the West standings, and I had a bunch of questions left. And so I was like, all right, well, let's just do another episode and talk about the rest of those questions because I think there's a lot of big questions that we have about this Clippers Mavs series. And questions that I'm going to ask Darian of Locked On Clippers later this week. Questions that Slightly Biased and I will answer a little bit later this week. But let's just get the questions out there and try sort of just like talk about them. So let's start here. Do the Mavericks need that third score? This is something we've kind of talked about all season or at least since the trades and since the Mavericks have gotten really good. Do the Mavericks need that third score to really step up? They made the trades and they didn't go get a Kyle Kuzma or a some someone like that. I keep mentioning his name because those were the actual rumors that they were going after somebody like that. They didn't get that guy. And then you thought, okay, well, Tim Hardaway Jr. should step up as that guy to be the third scorer, to be that guy that that scores, you know what, you know, between 15 and tw- sometimes 20, 23 points a game or something like that. And if you go back to the 2020 and the 2021 seasons again, series against the Clippers, Tim Hardaway Jr. was the second guy. He was the second scorer on the Mavericks. He averaged a ton of minutes in those series. He played between 45, 25 and 45 minutes in those games. He played 45 minutes in a game against the Clippers that the Mavs won. The Mavs won that game. And he scored between 28 points and he scored four points in a game that the Mavs did lose. And so you look back and you're like, man, do they need that kind of Tim Hardaway? Are they going to need that kind of scoring? And I said at the beginning, the answer is no. I don't think they need that guy. Can can that guy come out? That's a different question. Can can that Tim Hardaway Jr. bounce back and be that guy that he was? Because the playoffs are a different game. And guys are going to be left open. And Tim Hardaway's been there before. And you look at a guy like P.J. Washington, who his shot can be shaky. It has been great recently. And you look at a guy like Tim Hardaway Jr. His shot has not been great recently. But statistically, overall, he's been really good shooting for the Dallas Mavericks. And shot really well in the playoffs when he played. And so you're like, all right, well, which one wins out? I don't think they need that type of guy. And I think that the answer to that question, which is why I started with this, is because the Mavericks are such a different team now. This team is not the team of 2020 and 2021. That team had to live and die by the three. That team had to, you know, the the offense was the defense. You know, that was the case at the beginning of this season even. They needed that other guy. They needed that other score. I don't think this Mavericks team is going to need that. I don't think they'll need that third guy because of how much they've changed, because they've become a defensive team. Even that team in 2020 and 2021 that played the Clippers, that team was not a good defense. Those teams were not good defensive teams necessarily. The Mavs team that went to the Western Conference Finals in 2022, that team was. That team was a better defensive team. And they didn't need that third guy necessarily either. They had the shooters, the shooters that hit shots eventually. You had the Dorians, you had the Maxis, you had the Reggies, you had Dinwiddie even kind of as that kind of as that third guy. But you you didn't necessarily need one guy to be like, all right, get us a bucket. The Mavs don't have that guy. And Tim can hit some shots, but again, he's not going to be that guy to go get you a bucket. It would be a real luxury if the Mavs had that guy, but they don't. The Clippers, on the other hand, though, they do have that guy. They've got multiples of those guys. They have Kawhi, Paul George, 
And then they have, I guess James Harden is the third scorer. Isn't that insane to think about? It's still insane to me that James Harden plays on the Clippers, let alone that he is the third scorer on this team. And then you have Norman Powell. The Mavericks don't have a guy like Norman Powell. Tim Hardaway should be. He should be that type of guy. But Norman Powell can get his own shot in a way that Tim Hardaway just can't. And so the Clippers have two more guys compared to what the Mavericks have in terms of get your own bucket scorers. And so if you look on the Mavericks side, you know, can Tim Hardaway Jr. regain his confidence that he had in the 2020 and 2021 series? Maybe. He also waffled between four points and 28 points in that series. Now, he scored 17 points in nine out of the 13 games he played, 17 points or more. So he was scoring in those in those series. And when he scored more than 17, no, more than, let's say more than 16 points, the Mavs won the majority of those games. And the Mavericks didn't win a single game in either of the series that they played when Tim Hardaway scored less than 17 points. He scored 12, 11, 10, and 4, and they lost all four of those games. They needed him really badly. Now the second scorer is Kyrie Irving. And we talked about that earlier with Reggie. I think he is the big swing player for the Mavericks in terms of if he is really good, then I think this Mavericks team beats the Clippers pretty, pretty easily. At least, I mean... Easily, at least in in terms of the games that are played. That doesn't make any sense. I think they beat them easily in that I think that they they win in in five or six games. And the games could be close. The games could not be close. This this Mavericks team sometimes in the playoffs makes no sense. They play this Clippers team and some of the games are like, they they played a bunch of games and none of them were close in in terms of uh, the end score. Oh, man. So I don't think that they need that Tim Hardaway to come back. Can that Tim Hardaway come back? Sure. He's going to get a bunch of open shots. You look at the Mavs games that they played against the Clippers this season. Tim Hardaway averaged 30, 31 minutes a game in those, those, uh, in those three games that they played, and he took 16 shots a game. But he shot under 40% from the field. He shot 25% from three. And it was, it was rough shooting game for him against the Clippers. But I think he's going to get those open shots because everything is squeezed. Everything is like extra in the playoffs. And all of a sudden, those open shots are going to get even more open for him because everyone's going to put all the attention on Luka and Kyrie. And I think this Clippers team, their defense is not the same that it has been in the past. They don't have a Nick Batum. He's not walking through that door. And so I think that those shots that Tim Hardaway is going to get, and he's going to play. I don't know how much he's going to play, but he's going to. I think that he... He's going to he's going to uh, get more open shots when he plays, and we'll see. He could be a he could be an X factor type player where he can, you know, he could swing a game or, or or two. But Kyrie's the swing player, and because of Kyrie, they don't need Tim Hardaway to be that guy. I think that's pretty important. Another question I can get to quickly here is the rotations. What are the rotations going to look like? Jason Jason Kidd left it to to us to talk about it and to pontificate about. And so I'm going to pontificate about it today. That's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. He said, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to let you guys talk about it. That's what you do. Bet. That, that is what we do. That is what we do. We're going to talk about it. You got to ask them. I'm just the coach. Okay. He asked me. I looked back in 2022, and I looked back at, like, the players that saw the most minutes increase and the most minutes decrease from regular season to playoffs in 2022. The biggest increase was Reggie Bullock. He averaged 28 minutes a game in the regular season for the Mavericks that season. And it went up to 39. He went he went from like seventh on the Mavericks in minutes played or like sixth to first in 39 minutes a game. I think that player this season, I think that player is uh, is Derek Jones Jr. I don't know that he'll get first in minutes. I think PJ, I think Luca probably will. But I think that that kid takes those wings and I think he doesn't play them a ton. And then all of a sudden he like needs them really badly. <laughs> and then he starts playing them a ton. Uh, Derek Jones Jr. Finished the season with uh, averaging 20 minutes a game, 20 minutes a game, even starting February 5th. Like this is after the trades. He averaged 20 minutes a game. I think he's going to see the most minutes increase. I think he's going to play a lot. And I think that he'll see the most minutes increase the same way Reggie did in 2022. Dorian had the second highest increase. He went from 33 minutes to 38 minutes a game. And that's PJ Washington, who I think goes from, he's averaging 32 minutes a game to end the season with the Mavericks. I think he goes to like a 39, 40. Like, I think he's, it's the same as what they did with Bullock and Dorian. I think that he'll see a ton of minutes in that. Luca's already at 37 minutes a game in the regular season. I think it's the same kind of thing in, in 2020, 
two. He went from 35 minutes a game in the regular season to 36 minutes a game. So that's a 4% increase. I think we'll see kind of the same. I think Luka will go to like 38 minutes in this series. And then the, the, the next highest increase after the two wings was Brunson. Brunson went from 32 minutes a game to 35 minutes a game in the, in the playoffs. Kyrie, I don't know how much more you can give him. 36 minutes a game he played in the regular season. Can you play him more than that? They're already overlapping Luka and Kyrie as much as they could. So I find that interesting. The guys that saw the most decrease, I found the most interesting. Uh, Dinwiddie actually decreased in the from the regular season to the playoffs. Dinwiddie in the regular season was averaging 28 minutes a game on the Mavericks. And then went to 27 minutes a game. A 2% decrease for him. Which is like, that 2% doesn't sound a lot. But the fact that his minutes went down from the regular season to the playoffs is very interesting to me. That's Tim Hardaway Jr. to me. I think Tim Hardaway Jr.'s minutes go down. From February 5th to the end of the season, he was averaging 22 minutes a game. I think those go down. I think that's what it is. Because the minutes got to come from somewhere. The Derek Jones Jr. minute increase. The P.J. Washington in minutes increase. Luka and Kyrie minutes increase. It's got to come from somewhere. The other guy that saw a big minutes decrease in 2022 was Dwight. He went from 22 minutes a game to 14. 37% in, uh, decrease. Huge decrease. And uh, and that's probably lively this season. And maybe Gafford. But Gafford's only playing 21 minutes a game to end the season. G uh, lively played 19 minutes a game. And so I think both of those guys probably see some kind of decrease the same way that Dwight did. Because they are going to go to that small ball unit. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. The guy that saw the biggest decrease in 2022 was Josh Green. He went from 15 minutes a game in the regular season to seven. He didn't play a, he didn't play a lot in that, in that run. 51% decrease for, for Josh Green. And that's probably going to be the case now too. Josh played 25 minutes a game to end the season. And I don't see him getting more than, that, than you know, like 15 or 20 really. I think he gets a decrease too. Especially coming back from the injury. Hasn't looked that great. And he hasn't shot that great after the injury too, and so they'll they'll play him, and he'll be kind of a he'll his minutes will be swing. Like we'll see if he's shooting the ball well, then they'll play him more and all that. So I think that's how the minutes kind of shake out, and I think it'll look very similar to what we saw in 2022, where a kid decreased some guys' minutes, like you know Dwight and and uh, Josh Green and even Dinwiddie, and he increased the Wings' minutes in Bullock and Dorian. I think that's going to be PJ and Derek Jones Jr. and all that. There you go. That's the, that's the rotation coming up. Let's talk about the Mavericks shooting and the Mavericks playing big. Do the Mavericks have to stay playing big and can the Mavericks shooting hold up? Let's talk about all that and more coming up. A lot of you know me. A lot of you know that I get competitive. I start looking around and I'm like, okay, who's doing more Mavericks podcast episodes than me? I've, I've done almost 2000. I don't think there's been, I don't think there's anybody. Uh, I get competitive about some stuff. And so you know that if you get competitive, and if you get competitive too, I'm a big fan of Monopoly Go. You can play it. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on the Monopoly game where you can play not one, not two, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy different locations, including the moon. Take it to the moon. You can... Uh, uh, all kinds of crazy locations, amazing cities that bring you big money. The best part is you can mess with your friends too. You can charge them rent on iconic properties, such as the classic Monopoly ones. But now you can also rob their vaults of riches. You can rob your friends. How about that? Go down to the to the App Store and uh, join your friends. Download Monopoly Go free on the App Store or Google Play. Go check it out. Monopoly Go. Check out the game today. Also want to tell you about Game Time. Game Time has the place for all your tickets. I've used Game Time a lot. I went to go see an FC Dallas match this weekend. I enjoyed it. They scored zero goals between the two of them, but I still enjoyed it in my uh, very enjoyable experience was brought to you by Game Time, just like this episode. Uh, I went there, I went to the app, and I found cheaper tickets than I would on a competing website or the actual you know FC Dallas site where I got where I looked at tickets, and I got really good deal on them. Go check out; you can get last minute tickets as well. Last minute deal save up to sixty percent off buying last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, all kinds of stuff like that. Check it out at Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, redeem that code. L O C K E D O N N B A for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. I need a recovery beer. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad. We're going to continue. The Raccoon Squad continues all throughout the playoffs, and this is where we level up, baby. This is where we we get even stronger. 
Everybody's locked in. You're locked into the Dallas Mavericks. If you haven't listened to this show before and you're checking in for the playoffs, appreciate you. If you listen every day, you're part of the Raccoon Squad, and I love you guys. All right, let's get into some more questions about the Dallas Mavericks. We talked about, do they need that third score? The Mavericks have changed. What's the playoff rotation look like? Now let's get into some other big questions about the Mavericks. Will they be able to stay big? What if Derek Lively can't play? The staying big one is very interesting to me because at least on at least on Twitter, I've seen this sort of like frustration or just this, ugh, why is Jason Kidd playing Maxi? And you know, if you're out there, if you've listened to this show or you follow me on Twitter or you just have talked to me about the Mavericks, I have complained about things that Jason Kidd has done, for sure. I have complained about many decisions that he's made. I don't agree with some of the decisions he's made. This is not one of them. This is one I'm completely on board with him about. And, uh, I'm not playing. I'm watching, just like you guys. We're both watching the same thing, me and Jason Kidd. That the Maxi Kleba, P.J. Washington, like small ball type lineups, they work. And they work really well. The Mavs staying big with Daniel Gafford was a, a plus six net rating. They outscore opponents by six points per 100 possessions. It's pretty good. It's great. Their offense was 116 points per 100 possessions. That's pretty good. Their defense was 109 points per 100 possessions allowed. That's really good. Really good defense with Daniel Gafford at center. The lively minutes at center, this is for the full season, plus five and a half points per 100 possessions. That's really good. That's good too. Especially for a rookie center playing at that spot. He was put in a really hard spot and did really well. The offense was 122 points per 100 possessions. Amazing. Amazing offense with Derek Lively. The defense was 117 points per 100 possessions. And so the defense was like, average for this season or a little below average for this season, but it ended up being a good net rating. So the both centers bring different things and the lineups with them were both good. Now the maxi PJ small ball lineup outscored opponents by 19 and a half points per hundred possessions in like the 400 possessions that they played, which is almost four full games. Actually it's more than four full games. So that's a pretty decent sample size. It's not a big one, but it's a decent one. And maybe they don't outscore their opponents for 19 points per 100 possessions forever, but it's at least enough of a sample size for me to look at it and say, hey, that's good. That's that's good right there. 118 points per 100 possessions scored on offense. That's that's pretty good. That's really good for this season. Their defense. You ready for this one? I don't think you're ready for this one. I don't think you're ready for this, Jelly. 99 points per 100 possessions allowed on defense. It's really good. The small ball units actually played better defense. So for anyone that's concerned about, well, man, can the Mavericks stay big? And can they, can they, I'm just concerned that they can only play the small ball line. I don't want that. I don't want that in this series. I'm, I'm concerned that the bigs won't be able to play at all because James Harden brings a different, different level. The Clippers in the past, you could play bigs against them because they didn't do the screen and roll and everybody's got to, you know, you've got to switch and all that kind of stuff. Now with James Harden, it brings a whole other level that I'll talk about in a second. But with James Harden, you've got the, you've got a different wrinkle in the offense. And so can the Mavericks stay with that small ball? Can the Mavericks play those bigs at all? And do they have to just rely on this small ball lineup? But if they do have to play the small ball lineup, which I expect that they will, it's played really, really well and really well on defense, which is going to be huge for the Mavericks because they become a defensive team. And so if you see that, that's a positive for the Mavs. That small ball unit, the Mavs small ball unit is better than the Clippers small ball unit this year. So if the Clippers go to it and the Clippers try and out small ball you, they can play maxi and they can play better than the Clippers. At least statistically, at least within the last couple of months. Maybe the Clippers small ball unit comes out and surprises me, but it has not been as good as it has been in the past. They throw out Amir Coffey or whoever else they throw out in that small ball and it just doesn't work. The the Westbrook, Harden, Paul George, uh, Kawhi Leonard lineups, have not been that good this season. That's one that I was kind of surprised about. They've played 353 possessions, so like a little less than the Maxi small, like Maxi PJ small ball lineups that the Mavs have played. But with those four, the four stars, Kawhi, Paul George, James Harden, Westbrook, which is insane that they're all on the same team. It's kind of wild. They were outscored by their opponents six and a half points per 100 possessions. Those lineups did not work, and the Clippers kind of stopped using them. They started them for a while. I went back and I watched one of the Mavericks' early games against them, the one that Derek Lively played in earlier in the season, and they started that unit. They started Kawhi, Paul George, Harden, and Westbrook. It's when they first got you know, Harden kind of, 
And they were like, all right, we got to play all these guys because they're all stars before Westbrook accepted this bench role that he's been really good in. And they got outscored by a lot. Their offense was not good and their defense was terrible with those four this whole season. And so they haven't really used that anymore. And we'll, if they try it against the Mavericks, I think the Mavericks destroy it. And so, and the Mavericks went on a big run in that game and they won it, the one that, that they played earlier in the season. And that was before the trades with Gafford and PJ and all that. And so I'm curious. I'm curious, can, you know, can the bigs play? And if they have to go small, do the Mavericks beat them as much as I think that they will and should con- considering the numbers? The shooting, the Mavericks shooting. This is a big one. This is a big one. Will the shaky shooting hold up? In 2022, the Mavericks had incredible, I I think incredible, um, shooting, maybe not luck, but they had incredible shooting results, (laughs) considering what they were. The Mavericks had incredible shooting games. Maxi had that seven three-point game against the the Jazz. They had great shooting against the, the Suns. I think the Mavericks had just some really good shooting where you look at, okay, here's the playoff shooting numbers. Reggie, or Luca took about 10 threes a game and shot 38, 34% from three. That's fine. Reggie took seven threes a game, shot 40%. Dorian Finney Smith took six threes a game, shot 43%. Spencer Dinwiddie took five threes a game, shot 42%. He doesn't shoot that well anywhere else. He was shooting really well. Maxi took four threes a game and shot 44% from three. Brunson took four a game and shot only 35%. But that, that's fine too. And then even uh, Bertans, he played, remember Bertans played 18, played all 18 games in the playoffs. I, I need people to remember this, that Davis Bertans played 10 minutes a game for the Mavericks. He played 18 games when they went to the Western Conference Finals. Luka in the playoffs is no joke, guys. Davis Bertans. And he shot 30, 37% on three a game. All their role players shot well in the playoffs. Will, they, will the Mavericks this season have the same kind of luck or the same kind of um, timing, shooting timing, let's put it that way, well-timed shooting timing than they did in 2022 in the playoffs? Let's go since like February. Let's go February 5th, which is like kind of the trades. Let's go some of the three-point shooting. Luka's shooting really well, 11 threes a game. He's shooting about 39%. Great, amazing. 11 threes a game, 39% is insane. MVP, MVP right there. Uh, PJ Washington shot about six threes a game and shot 31%. Tim Hardaway, about the same thing, 32% for him on six. So those guys have not shot the ball well. PJ, a little bit better the last couple of games here in the last week or so, last couple weeks, but not that great. Derek Jones Jr., about 32% on two a game. And like, this is what I'm talking about. And then Maxi, two a game, 34%. All four of those guys are going to be huge. And then XM, 51%, two a game. Okay, I'm done. I'm done, <laughs> I'm done with the sides. Those, those four, PJ, Tim Hardaway, Derek Jones Jr., and XM. And then Maxi, five. Those five. If those five shoot all 31 and 32%, I think it's going to be tough for the Mavericks to beat teams. I think they have to hit these open shots because they're only going to get opener. They're only going to get opener. The open shots are going to get opener. I'm not saying more open. I'm saying opener because I think they're going to be the openest. Because Luka and Kai, the Clippers are going to have to bail out. They're going to have to sell super hard to, to off of Luka and Kyrie. They're going to have to sell so hard against those, those guys. And I think the Mavs are going to have some open threes. I think they're going to have a lot of open threes. And can they hit them? And the pace. The pace with Westbrook is something that I really want to focus on in a second. And the pace, the Mavericks are going to have to slow down sometimes. And in the playoffs, it slows down anyway. They can't play this faster style that, they, that they've wanted to. They can in, in moments, and I think the Mavericks are are like prepared to do that. But they are going to have to go back to their roots and like slow down the offense. And when they slow down the offense, those catch-and-shoot threes, those half-court threes are really going to matter a lot and are going to swing a lot of games. And can P.J., 32, 31%. Tim Hardaway, 32%. Derek Jones Jr., 33%. Maxi Kleba, 34%. Can all those guys hit these shots that they need to hit? I think their shaky shooting is something that we need to focus on a little bit more. If it swings the right way and a lot of guys start hitting, or even half the guys start hitting, that's really good for the Mavericks. If they don't, Mavs are going to have to find other ways to win. And they have. They beat the Nuggets and shot under 30% from three as a team. They beat the Kings and didn't shoot that well from three in one of the games, right? Maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe it was the, the Heat. But they've won games. 
they have one game, so they didn't shoot well from three since the trades. And it's just a different team. But I think the shooting is going to matter. All right, let's talk about some Clippers questions here. Can Westbrook impact? Can Westbrook's impact translate to the playoffs? Russell Westbrook has been very good for the Clippers in his role. He's coming off the bench. He's running that second unit. He's you know doing Westbrook things. He's pushing the pace. He's doing good things. But Westbrook has been pushing the pace with them. And in the half court, they're just a little worse with him. When he's when he's on the court, their half court offense is 118 points per 100 possessions, which is still really good. But when he's off the court, it's 121 points per 100 possessions. So it's about three points difference, which is a big swing when he's on and when he's off. And everything in the playoffs gets squeezed and, and like everything is bigger. And so I'm curious what they do with Westbrook and can his impact that he's had pushing the ball in transition, can it be the same kind of impact? What do you do with him in the half court? They still score well. 118 points per 100 possessions is still really good. But it doesn't stay that way. Do the, do the Mavericks, who have been the ninth best half court defense since the trades, do, do they just like make Westbrook not playable on off? Like that, that's going to be really interesting to me. How does he, what does he do in the half court? How do they impact, how does that, the slowing down, like you're going to have less transition possessions in general and more half court ones. So I think these numbers are going to be like exaggerated even more. And so I'm really curious about that. I'm curious about Westbrook's impact in the pace of play. The Mavericks will have to, they'll have to slow down. Every team has to. Mavericks were ninth in pace this season. The Mavericks like to push ahead, but the Mavericks don't rely on that pace necessarily. They don't like, if you get them out of their, if you get them out of their pace and you're like, oh, all you got to do is slow down the Mavericks. Oh yeah? All you got to do is slow down the Mavericks and make Luka and Kyrie isolate in the half court? It's like, oh, that doesn't work. <laughs> like, they, they destroyed Luka as one of the most efficient isolation players in NBA history this season. Kyrie, really good in isolation. The Mavericks as a team in the half court were the seventh best half court offense this season. The Clippers were the fourth one. And so I'm really curious I'm really curious what they do. And I'm, I'm really curious how they, they handle. I'm really curious how they handle this. I also think that I had those half court numbers wrong. I don't think that was their offense in the half court. I think that was their offense in general now that I'm looking at it. So I'm really glad I spent all that time. I'm glad I spent all that time explaining it. Then the point still stands. The numbers may have not been correct now that I look at it because 118 points per 100 possessions in the half court would be like insanely efficient. The point still stands. What does Westbrook do in the half court? Can his can his impact still stand? <laughs> I'm glad all these new people are listening to the show for me to just completely botch those numbers really badly. Uh the point still stands. Can the Mavericks can they can the Mavericks play their own like control their pace in the in the way that they get their fast stuff on offense and they keep the Clippers away from doing fast stuff. Keep the Clippers out of transition. Play transition yourself. It's classic basketball stuff, but as, that's where we are with this Mavs Clippers thing. My big question about the Clippers, and this is one that I can't really answer right now, but I'm curious what Darian's going to say about this when we do the crossover. Why did their defense fall off so hard? Their defense fell off so hard. The Clippers defense, from the beginning of the season to February 6th, it's like a long time, was 13th. The Clippers went 34 and 15 in that time. They're really good, like top of the the West, feeling really good about themselves. The Harden trade was play, was really good, and that was even after they lost like seven in a row when they first got Harden. So they were, I mean, they were killing it. 114 points per hundred possessions allowed. Great for this season. Then for like two months, February 7th to March 25th, they went 17 and 15, and their defense was 29th. They dropped from like a, an average, like a slightly above average defense to one of the worst in the NBA, like literally one of the worst defenses in the NBA for two whole months. And I'm fascinated to hear what he's going to say about how they fell off that hard because it just went. And maybe they're kind of like the Mavs where they don't have as many good solid defenders anymore. You know, like with your Batum's gone, your Patrick Beverly's gone. Like they just don't have the same kind of guys. They replaced them with Harden and Westbrook and an aging Paul George and Kawhi who are just not going to hit those same all defensive levels like they used to. Norman Powell coming in. Like they they just don't have the same type of defenders that they used to, the quality ones. And so when it falls off, it really falls off hard. And so maybe that's how, and the Mavericks used to be like that. And the Mavericks have not been like that in 
since the trades. Very different styles now that we're, we're looking at between what the Clippers were before, what the Clippers are now, and what the Mavericks were before, and what the Mavericks are now. And that's what we're going to talk about with Isaac tomorrow, and I'm very excited to talk about that. The differences between the Mavs in 2020 and 21 and the Mavericks right now. We're going to talk about that with Isaac tomorrow. So join me there. Guys, thanks for checking out this bonus episode. If you haven't listened to the episode with Reggie from earlier in the day, go check that one out. Guys, thanks for listening to Locked on Mavs. Peace out. Boom. Oh, yeah. Bonus. Bonus episode. Going to the playoffs. Going to the playoffs.